This is Board Bag Studio, the podcast where I talk to snowboarders about their habits regarding fitness, health, and everything else. I'm Jesse Paul, and today I spoke with Amanda Hankison. For this episode, I spoke with Amanda in her kitchen in Salt Lake City, Utah. She has been through a lot and she's accomplished a lot. She was really fun to talk to, had so many cool things to say, cool stories. Uh, We started out talking about some snowboarding. We talked naturally a little bit about women's snowboarding and Jetpack, a little production company that she had started with some friends a couple years back. That was amazing. She told me about a tumor that she had gotten and how horrible that was, but also how that really changed her outlook on life. Um, We talked about some trail running that she had gotten into. She's ran marathons, climbed mountains. She's really into split boarding. She told me a little bit about that. Um, How all these activities have affected her body and what she does to recover. And just some ways that she's figured out how to deal with the stress of all those intense activities. Uh, She told me about the kind of diet that she's on, partially because of the autoimmune disease she has called Hashimoto's. We talked a little bit about that, but she is vegan and gluten-free right now. And as you can imagine, it's a little bit of a struggle. So she talks about how she deals with that. She told me about some of the techniques that she's used to get sober and stay sober. And like I said, she had a lot of amazing things to share She's super inspiring to me, and I'm sure you guys will feel the same way after this. So I bring you Amanda Hankison. Hey, Amanda. Hey, Jesse. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for being on as my second guest. Yeah, I'm very excited. Awesome. Um, so we were at Sculpt today. Oh, yeah. At Brighton. How was it for you? It was amazing. That was one of the most fun uh, snowboard contests I've been to recently. It was, it was like so community oriented. You totally forgot you were in a contest. It was fun to watch everyone's session and you weren't even keeping score in your own head because sometimes there'd be a feature that nobody was getting at all. And you're like, oh, cool. Everyone's pretty even here. Like, this is nice. It was almost my favorite, the features that everybody had a hard time with because (laughs) everybody's on the edge of their seat. Like, is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? And like, oh man, the, the, uh, the one with the snow skate, mm-hmm. shove on, shove off. As soon as somebody landed it, everybody's hands went up. It was like the wave. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Um, but yeah, for those who don't know what Sculf is, it's basically like, it's like golf for snowboarding. Each feature has a trick that you're supposed to do. And if you get it first try, it's a hole in one and it's a nine hole course and it took all day. Yeah. It's crazy took way long I didn't know it would take that long but it was so, it was just so fun to hang out with everyone in between holes and yep. uh just kind of decide where you want and that that wheel that you had to spin Jill got like oh, switch geez. back lip pretzel oh man <laughs> Jill got that yeah geez. yeah but then watching Spenny and Stax do it again and again like doubles that was yeah. pretty cool yeah that was cool yeah I got lucky on that one I got a trick that I do all the time oh, just nice. back one on I was like oh sweet <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um, was that your first time boarding for the year? Uh, it was my third time. I had one day up at Bone Zone, uh, kind of at the beginning of when the snow fell. And then there was this freak storm in October that uh, we went for a little tour up in Little Cottonwood. Oh, sick. And uh, there, there was like no turns to be had, really. But it was just fun to go up and see the snow, see what's sticking up there. and Yeah. Were you split boarding up there? Yeah, yeah. Cool. So we, we went up, um, yeah, I had been up hiking there like two days before and it was surprisingly deep when we got up towards the ridge line. It was like maybe like ankle or knee deep in some spots. And then 14 inches were supposed to come in that Wednesday and I was like, oh my God, we should go look at it. Wow. And uh, so yeah, a couple of friends and I went up early before they had to go to work and uh, broke trail all the way up there in like Sick. a foot and a half of snow and... We got like two turns off the top, but the snow was really upside down. So it was like super heavy and sticky on yeah. top and uh, you're dodging rocks and stuff. But yeah. we weren't going anywhere fast. But yeah, it, was, yeah. it was just really fun to be out. 
Man, that's cool. I, I have a split board, but I've never used it. We should I've, use I've it. I've procrastinated on getting bindings for, I've had it for, I think, three years now. It's kind of... Well, now, now, now that Union's doing their, their thing, that's like yeah. a whole other source of bindings. Yeah. Because they Would were you? really hard to get for a while. And uh, yeah, now Union's stuff is progressing pretty quickly. And yeah. I've got an extra pair in the garage. Really? You, help, you help me get out there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will definitely take you up on that because... You know, I, I don't really, I know a couple of people who go out and do it, but I, I feel like having never done it, I don't want to be, you know, a burden on anybody or anything like that. But yeah. it seems like it'd be fun for sure. Oh yeah. It's, it's just a fun way to be outside, uh, in the mountains when, and especially here in Salt Lake, just the main two canyons, you can't have snowmobiles in them and there's really good mountains to ride there. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense to use your feet. Yeah. And, uh, you, you've been split boarding for a while. Uh, this is maybe my, th- my third year doing it, which is kind of crazy. Cause it seems like, like I've been doing it longer maybe, yeah. but um, yeah. So, uh, after, after I had that tumor, I, uh, I was out for that whole season. So the next season I was like really fiending to get after it. And just luckily it was like the se- best season in 10 years that Utah had. So, That's uh, just kind of with like blind luck, I was able to top out on a couple peaks in the Wasatch and. Uh, I was really just uh, trying to figure it out as I went along. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, we got to do things like we, we rode past rappel bolts that are next to like a 50 foot cliff that usually have to rappel halfway down the line. We just rode Whoa. past the bolts because it was filled in with snow. It was like unreal conditions. That... R- r- rappel down the line. I'm not totally familiar <laughs> uh, like if you So when you get uh, like a, a couloir, so it's like a narrow strip of snow between yeah. rocks. And, uh, and sometimes there's a cliff in the middle of it. And so you'll, you'd ride the beginning of it on belay. You'd like kind of be on a rope and then you, cause you're really exposed. Like the only way down is over this cliff. Uh-huh. And so then you get down to, uh, these bolts that are drilled into the rock and you, you put a loop or you put a rope through the, those loops and then you use like a harness and you rappel down like the 50 foot cliff and wow. then you pull the rope down and then you finish, then you keep... finish riding down. Damn. And, uh, and, and at that, but at that point I didn't know how to repel and, and I was like Googling it the night before and I was like, okay, like we're just not going to do it. We're, we're going to go to the top of Fiverrhorn, but we're not going down the line because I don't know how to do this safely. And then Parker and I get to the top and it was filled in. You could see it from the top. So wow. That's <laughs> we, crazy. we still ended up, that was, that was like a 17 hour day. It was, it was pretty, 17 hours. pretty rugged. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn, that's crazy. But it was it was pretty cool. That's, um, it's like mountain climbing and splitboarding in one. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, like splitboard mountaineering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's crazy. Yeah, that that's that's my favorite thing. But um, it was crazy that being my first season because then it's ha- it hasn't been like that. Like last season was not like that. And last yeah. season there was a really bad avalanche problem in Utah, and so really I think I went splitboarding in Utah twice last year um because it the at there was really low snow and then where there was snow um there was this really rotten layer right at the ground so things were Mm. just ripping all the way to the ground and there was some groups of people that had like maybe 60 years experience touring in the wasatch between the group and they were getting caught in stuff on really low angle like the safest slope there was and they were getting carried in in slides so it was that's scary it was way too touchy to be out here so i can't believe i didn't know how lucky i was getting that first year until yeah. we had last year and I was like oh wow you can't just you can't just walk out the door and do this yeah. every day yeah Did you, do you have experience with classes and mountain safety I'm sure yeah Stuff like that yeah I did uh I did my Abbey one um with this event that Kimmy Fasani does called Amusement Mountain uh we did that in 2016 and then I did Last year when the avalanche problem was so bad I, I signed up for an Abbey two course and went to Jackson and did that to try to figure out why the snow is so rotten mm-hmm. and uh and then this this year i'm signed up to do a avi one pro which is um like for snow science professionals oh, and i kind of cool. i kind of wiggled my way in there with s- snowboarding but um i it's it's Damn. pretty cool you have to you have to um it's a five-day class and you have to pass a test at the end that they're like a certified avi one pro person Dang. and so after that i should be able to like go to a slope and evaluate it just without really knowing much about the snowpack, dig a pit, evaluate it and decide if I want to ride it or not. Damn. That's cool. So that's, 
that's pretty important for the things that I want to do. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the biggest uh, blocks for me to get out in the back country is just, you know, I know a couple people who have been in avalanches and it sounds terrifying and I know nothing. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I definitely should take a class, especially if I want to start split porting a little bit. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's really cool. And like, like I, what I, what I try to, t- cause sometimes people get so intimidated by the class and all the expensive gear and all of that. And it's really, really the, the most important thing when you're starting is, is to, um, just practice your beacon drills. Like if you, if you use your beacon to find another beacon, like you just do it with your friends, you can like hide a beer with the mm. beacon and you can just do it out in a flat snowy area. Oh, cool. But just doing beacon drills and getting used to using your gear in a rescue yeah. scenario yeah. can make a uh, uneducated avalanche person really useful if if you're in that situation. Um, yeah. And that's something you can do a lot easier um, to to work on yourself, and you can do it with your friends. So I like suggesting that to people because it's it's hard to it's hard to go just blindly do an avi one class if you don't go in the mountains very much and in like a like traveling in the mountains way because you don't have a context for it and so when you're in the avi one you're just kind of blindly hit with all of this information and then you have to take like a year or two to really digest it all and go out with people you trust that have more knowledge than you and yeah build some hands-on experience yeah that that's like just as important as taking the classes is just like being open to like go poke around and see what snow is like and yeah like when I'm when I'm out, I just walk around and I talk about everything I see. I'm like, oh, the snow is starting to melt off that tree. And then you're like, punch your pole through and you're like, oh, there's some loose snow under here. And maybe you put your hand in and you pull out a bunch of sugar snow and you're like, oh, wow, that that's not good. Like yeah. there was a crust on top of that. And and uh, you're just talking, you know, the wind changed. And like, that's yeah. pretty much all I even talk about when I'm out touring with people because it's fun to make observations, but it's all part of just making sure you're aware of your surroundings. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable how different snow can be just, I mean, it always blows my mind. The fact that you can put together a pile of loose, like sugary snow, just put it in a pile. And then if it's cold overnight, it's going to be hard as a rock the next day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, just, you know, same thing with packing it down. It becomes ice. It's, I mean, I'm sure all that stuff is, I, I have some experience with like, I think that if I was given some, idea of how how snow forms these layers and things like that i think i could maybe oh for be sure like, just kind of connect like okay yeah that makes sense because yeah you know I, I mean i have worked with snow a lot and, <laughs> uh, yeah it's it's not it's not rocket science by any means it's yeah. it's like really attainable stuff you yeah. just have to want to learn it yeah and you can but get your hands dirty a little bit yeah yeah. But I remember your, your verts technique, you like integrated the verts oh, on, yeah. on the lip all... in the streets and then you you had the torch on it and yep. I had like more surface area for the torch. And I was like, yes. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, I've slowly picked up habits throughout the years. <laughs> the, the, the verts was from Bodhi though. Oh, nice. Because he makes, you know, massive jumps because yeah. he has to fly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I saw him using them. It's like, that is genius because you can use your whole body weight and packs it down super well you don't you know smashing on a giant lip with a shovel for one only does so much and two you just it's get exhausting. so tired yeah. yeah um but anyways uh so i want to step back just a quick second mm-hmm. um you brought up the the tumor and i, I did oh, want to yeah. get into that i didn't think it would come so early but let's <laughs> let's unpack that okay tell me the story um i so it was my first fall out of school, and I w- I was gardening during the day, um, and then I'd go work at Salty Peaks at night, writing online descriptions for stuff in their store. And so I was I was working like probably like ten to fourteen hours a day, five days a week, and I was just like, cool, like I'm grinding and I'm getting like I'm setting myself up for winter, and this is sick because I was just like really excited to not be in school anymore. And then, uh, and winter was coming up and there was the, the derby race with the split board race. And I was, I was like, that was like my third time ever split boarding. And I got second behind Maria wow. Dabari and she was like a minute and a no half way. faster than me. And oh, I was wow. just like, Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Congrats. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. It, it was <laughs> like the craziest, I think the tumor gave me like superhuman strength or something wow. <laughs> because I was able to get through all that, like tons of manual labor and, and the, the race and all that. And then by the time I got into January, I just didn't feel okay. I'd quit the gardening job. I quit Salty Peaks. 
I wasn't snowboarding. I had this terrible pain in my back and I thought I was dying. Like I would just every night just want to do nothing. And I, I wouldn't leave the house and like I've, I've been, I've had depressive episodes before, but it really felt like my insides weren't okay and uh and so one night I was still playing once a week on this indoor soccer league with my friends and I got hit really hard it was a co-ed league and this big guy we just went for the ball and I I went down and this was after you've already been feeling like shit yeah yeah this was like the one time a week I was leaving the house was to go play soccer damn that's pretty crazy thing to leave the house to like (laughs) be doing one thing (laughs) anyways it's it's, uh um they're my really good friends it was like fun to spend time with them yeah and uh and I went down and I I just had to pee so bad. So I like run to the bathroom, can't pee. And I'm like, oh my God, this is a crazy UTI. Like this is really crazy. And then uh, the next day I had to go to the ER because I I couldn't go to the bathroom. And it was a searing sharp pain in my (sighs) abdomen. And uh, so they did, they got me in and did an ultrasound. And the, the lady turned to me and like turned the ultrasound screen to me. And she's like, there's a big mass in your abdomen and it was there's just this big black circle on the ultrasound and there's this part of me that was really relieved by that because i just thought i was dying i thought my body had betrayed me i was just getting i was almost i was like almost 25 and i was like well this is just when you die i guess and uh and so there was a part of me that was really relieved to know that there's something inside of me causing this pain and so it was it was like a it was like a a five centimeter diameter um like half pound tumor that was on my ovary and it had torsed on itself so it's like when it folds on on itself and that's why i couldn't go to the bathroom and um so they added and i was in a i had a wait so it was like i mean sorry if this is asking too much but it it was like holding back the pee yeah yeah like it it had like torsed on itself so it was it was just like in (sighs) a zone where where uh, my bladder couldn't like be functional and uh, and so they gave me a catheter and I had to wait a week for surgery. So I just like laid in bed on painkillers with a catheter for a week. And then I got it out and and that triggered some really crazy emotional stuff. And because I think it's, it's on your ovary, that's like your hormones and where, oh, like yeah, emotions and everything come from. Mm-hmm. And and I I went super dark, like so dark for a couple of days. And I just I, I lost it for a couple of days. I didn't know which way was up. I was like freaking out. I called the doctor. They're like, no, you shouldn't have any emotional side effects. Like it yeah, was, it was well, a tumor. And, and, okay. uh, and well, be- hold on before uh, we, uh, before we get into that side, you, uh-huh. you were in the hospital for a week. Well, I, knowing... I, I was at home um, oh, okay. for that week. You were just, okay. But you knew you had a tumor. Yeah. What was going through your head at that point? Um, it was, it was really hard because that, that was the set, that would have been the second year we were filming for Jetpack. Okay. And that was what I had, um, I had dedicated like my whole being to doing that the last, the year before. And I was super hyped on how it all worked out. And, um, and so when I was laying in bed, uh, was when they were on a trip to Washington, Don went on, on that trip and, yep. and I, we were go- we were all going to go on it, but I was like, you, you have to film them. Like, I can't, I can't go. I'm, I can't leave the bed. And, uh, and so I just knew that they were all off doing this awesome, like backcountry trip in Washington. And, and I was just there and, and I felt it was, it was not that great of a winter. So I felt super disconnected because nobody was in Salt Lake yeah. and I wasn't really talking to anyone because it just, the, the, the emotional low that came with just not being able to do my activities and feeling like my body wasn't working um, it had been building on you for a while. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and so I, I don't, I don't know. I was just like, I having a catheter for a week is. I'm sure I know there's lots of people with lots of crazier stuff, but I just I mean, you don't downplay it. That, yet, everybody, <laughs> that that was that was. Um, it was just like it felt humiliating and just the way that I, I just, my body didn't work all of a sudden. I thought that I, I was like, Oh, split boarding. And like, I'm going to do this and jetpack And, and then everything fell through my fingers. It was just watching like a bit, like you made this awesome sandcastle finally after working at it. And then it just all slipped through my fingers. And I was like, okay, I, Jeez. it's all gone. <laughs> And, uh, and so that, that was pretty hard to, to stomach just during the whole process. And it was really hard to come back from that. Cause I had, um, so it took about a month to recover cause I had to do like a open, um, 
an open scar. So I had a lot of yeah. stitches and had to wait for my abdomen wall to heal and everything. And, and right when I came back, I went on this tear. I was like, I went to bogus base and there's a bank slalom. I went to the JLA bank slalom and uh, I, I, I got to, uh, I did, did well in that. And then there was uh, amusement mountain after it, like the second portion. And, um, and that, that, that was really awesome. I, I got to ride this, this line called the mossy crack, um, out in, like kind of on the crest in Mammoth and mm -hmm. that was the first time I'd ever been in terrain like that before and oh, wow. I was with I was with a bunch of awesome ladies it was like my first time really getting to know Kimmy who's been a really important uh woman in my life and uh and that whole time like I would I would be we'd be having like the welcome dinner and I'd go in the bathroom and I would just cry yeah. <laughs> and then I'd come out and I'd be like nope no issues here because I it was hard to be around so many people and to just be try to act like nothing had happened to act mm -hmm. like I hadn't just been pretty much alone for four months dealing with this tumor mm -hmm. and um and um sorry just to, oh, to backtrack you so this was a while after the surgery yeah the, this was like a, mo a month after okay. the surgery yeah and and did these people did you tell people they About they it? they knew, but it's really hard for people to grasp things yeah, it's probably, if they don't have direct experience. It's probably one of those things that, like everybody, you know, is kind of like, oh, I hope she's doing all right. But how do I even how do yeah. I bring it up? Especially if you're acting all happy and positive, I would have a hard time being like, hey, so, like, you okay? Like, you yeah. seem good, but that was pretty intense. You know, I can yeah. imagine that was kind of crazy to live that double life a little bit yeah and i've like i've i've only in the last in the like the last year even become comfortable with with like sad feelings publicly or being yeah. able to tell people about emotional issues mm -hmm. um and and so that that this was like two two years ago and so it was it was impossible for me then to be honest with people about like how i was feeling because i had just been i like i i had had to bail on every single trip this whole like production that i had been been working on for the last year and a half i had no part in the filming of it i've missed all these trips yeah. i i just felt like i didn't even belong anymore but all of a sudden i had to go be with a bunch of like olympians and other yeah. pro snowboarders <laughs> and i was supposed to be filming all of them and it was the same time i was having uh because when when you're just like lying there with some sort of thing that is making you sick um, you start to think about like, okay, like if, if this is it, like, are you stoked on your life? Are you excited yeah. about where you've been and what you've done and what you've contributed? Like, do you feel like the person that you see yourself as, do you feel like other people can see that in the world? Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, they can't. I haven't. No, really? I, I gotta, I gotta change some shit. Like I gotta, no I gotta go do some things. And, uh, and I'd just been so focused on, on, uh, creating the creating jetpack and like trying to create these opportunities for these girls that I saw riding that I, I just thought were really talented and nobody seemed to be paying attention to them. And so yeah. I, I had spent so much time like focusing on highlighting them that I had, I had kind of just neglected like what it is that I wanted to be doing. Mm -hmm. And, and there's nothing like a tumor that takes you out for a whole winter to really light a fire under yeah, your ass and just yeah. be like, Hey, remember you like remember what you want to do yeah. like why don't you go try and do that and yeah. and so going into the next winter um it was it was cool because what we were doing had, was starting to work like the girls were getting other opportunities and and some things were moving and it was it was okay for me to kind of take a step back and uh and that's when that's when that great winter happened mm -hmm. it yeah was all you, really you started serendipitous <laughs> yeah started split boarding first yeah, yeah and then yeah. and then you've been on a wild ride of like <laughs> trail running and, and mountain climbing and yeah. you're just like doing crazy shit all the time like, yeah i feel like every time i uh hear something or, or see something of you it's like wow there she is just <laughs> fucking doing the most insane stuff um uh, that it's it that's really inspiring and that it's it's the fact that that was such a transformative experience for you, uh, in, in a positive way, mm -hmm. it's, that's crazy. I mean, I, yeah, I, and I, to be honest, like the stuff you were doing with Jetpack was incredible. And I, Thank I think you. you really were accomplishing something like that. And, it, uh, it's interesting to hear me or to hear you say 
that you felt like you weren't living to your fullest because I mean, you know, seeing those videos, it was incredible. Like you, you guys really had something going and, uh, but I mean, that's, you know, you're the only person that knows you and it, it's really cool that I guess what I'm saying is even though it, it seemed like you were being super successful, the fact that it wasn't a hundred percent true to being your best self in a way mm -hmm. is interesting. Well, it's, it's, yeah. it's like a, it's a hard pill to swallow too when, when you do it because you try to, like I, I had to admit to myself, I wasn't being fully honest with myself yeah. all the time because, um, it's, uh, it also doesn't help that you guys just didn't get everything you deserved from all that stuff. <laughs> you know, just fucking, no, but you guys were doing amazing stuff. And we're, 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 I, I think we're reaping the benefits now in a way where there's, there's some girls moving to Salt Lake now and the, mm -hmm. they come up and they're like, Oh, like I watched Jetpack and oh, that's I cool. wanted to move to Utah and, and I'm just so excited yeah. about that. And it's yeah. so fun to talk to them and just be like, yeah, cool. Like, what's up? Want to snowboard? Like, want to hang out? What are we doing? Like, this yeah. is great. And so, um, cause that's what I was doing it for. I was, I was like doing it to highlight who I was filming, but I yeah. wanted to just put something out there that, that, um, that younger girls could watch and they could just be like, this is sick. Like, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and and it's not like that wasn't already happening. There was plenty of stuff coming out, but I just like saw, saw a, a void that I wanted to explore. And so mm -hmm. to know that it had an impact on other people coming up, um, that was, that's really meaningful to me. So it's cool now a couple of years afterwards, having people talk about it to me and I'm just like, Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. That's yeah. amazing. It was definitely like, it was amazing. That's all I can say. <laughs> Thanks. But, uh, so you, have continued to be involved in uh, video production for females and things like that. I mean, for just in general, but I know that you have a huge passion for representing women in action sports and, mm -hmm. and generally, um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, it's, it's been, um, I guess my, my own personal journey with it is it's, it, it just has a lot to do with my own um, like physical form yeah. because uh, when I was growing up snowboarding with Alexa in Illinois, um, we both were like snowboarding. This is what we're going to do. This is sick. I love this. And, and then by the time we made it to Utah, I was, I was enough injuries deep that I was like, I want to do this. I want to be with all these people. I want to, I want to be a part of this whole thing. And I love to snowboard, but I can't, I can't do more injuries. Like I need mm -hmm. to take a break from the injuries. And at that time was when, um, like the internet, we, you could start uploading videos. Like Yobi was really a poppin then. Mm -hmm. And you, you like made videos and you could watch them and you knew like every single video that came out because there weren't yeah, as many there, as there yeah, are now. Is, uh, and, uh, and this is pre, sure. pre Instagram I'm talking. Yeah. Now there's barely <laughs> even fit it in a day. And, uh, <laughs> and so, I, I was like, Alexa and I were sitting on the roof of this house that we moved into and, uh, and, and she was like, cool. Like I, I want to snowboard. Like we're, I'm going to snowboard all winter long. Like this, these are my plans. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to get a camera. Like I'm going to get so a camera sweet. because I can't snow. I, I don't have the passion to pursue street riding the way that you do. And, but I want to be there for it and I want to mm -hmm. help you. And I want to like help our friends. I want to do this. So um, I was talking to one of my friends that I was living with at the time and I was like telling him I was going to get a camera and he laughed at me and he literally said like girls don't film like Jeez. that's not you shouldn't and, and he was like what kind of camera do you want to get and I was like well I've, I like I know there's a couple different kinds I don't, I don't really know that much yet and he's like see like you don't even know what kind of camera you want to get like you can't <laughs> okay. do this whatever and and I just it's so funny to me to think that he actually said that now, yeah. but at the time that that's, that was, it's kind of the mentality. That was the mentality. And, and so, um, yeah, I got a camera and it took a long time of just bumbling around and trying to film people and being really bad at filming and like getting kind of shit on by anyone that I asked for help. And, um, and there, yeah, there's just, uh, so many vivid memories I have of approaching 
guys that were filmers of all different kinds and just completely getting shut down with it. No advice, no direction, mm. just telling me to kind of buzz off. Yeah. And, uh, uh and yeah. That. <laughs> my girlfriend, Ashley Dawn, uh, you guys are good friends. <laughs> yes. And she has experienced a lot of the same things. Uh, and she had a friend who was really good at, sn at snowboarding, Stephanie Sufeld, and she just got a camera one time and started filming her. And I know for a while she, she had a pretty hard time just really getting people to help her out to figure things out and stuff like that. And, and it's, I mean, it's just unfortunate that it can be so difficult like that. But. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm super proud of Mia for sticking with it. Cause yeah. she was filming the snowboarder movie this yep. year. And that was, that was cool to see her in that. And, uh, it's, it's, when I, when I talk to, there's this, uh, uh, women's film festival called no yeah. man's land. Yeah. That's and, what I was, that, yeah. That I wanted to, yeah. And, and, uh, it's, it's in Carbondale, Colorado every September. And when I talk to the women, they, I'm the only person from snowboarding that shows up. Like there's cool. rock climbers and cyclists and pack rafters and trail runners and hikers and uh, every single discipline of outdoor things, ski, like different kinds of skiers. I'm the only snowboarder that shows up to that. And when I tell them that, uh, that, that Mia and me and Ashley Dawn were like the only girls that I know of trying to film, they are just flabbergasted. Yeah. They just have no understanding of why. And, and there, there was a guy there who was helping document the, the event. And, and I asked him some questions about microphones one day at dinner and he just laid it all out for me. He was like, Oh, these, this is the information that you need. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you just helped me more than any, any single male snowboard filmer has ever helped me in like the eight years I've been doing that. And yeah. he was like, what? <laughs> oh man. And so th that, that's just uh, kind of what's real with. It's good to hear that, that, <laughs> uh, that in the larger industry that the, it's not everywhere, you know? Yeah. I mean, making progress. Yeah. But that's definitely, um, it, it was part of, it was part of the whole, the whole wave that took me in the direction I'm going now. Yeah. If, if we had done what we did and there was any sort of place for it to have a home, or if there was a company that saw saw value in mm -hmm. it at all, yeah. I think I could have just kept going For with sure. filming because Absolutely. if you if you do something and you're successful at it, it's really easy to keep doing it. Yeah. And I I truly felt like I put forth my best effort that I had, and it, all it did was get capped off with me having a tumor and having to miss yeah. the first actual season we'd have together. <sighs> and uh, and after that it it was, I didn't see any, any prospects. I didn't think that I, I saw no chance of success for myself because it just a lot of, a lot, and a lot of filming does come out of pocket and it's not, it's mm. not, you don't, you don't film snowboarding cause you want to be rich. No, that's not that's, what you do. That's for and, sure. <laughs> and, but when, when you are carrying around thousands of dollars of gear and, and computers and doing so many things, and you're still paying to do that after years of doing it, um, it's, it's hard to keep going. And I, ha mm -hmm. I, have, I have immense respect for people that do keep going. Like mm -hmm. pe people like John Stark, he's, he's done so much things yeah. without support and he's done things with support and he's just driven to keep going. And, and that's where I look at it now and, and as people like Durham too, like they, yeah. they are true filmers that's what they yeah. fucking do yeah and they cre they create things and they work together with other people and they document it and they put it together in a creative manner and it's beautiful and it's amazing and that's just what they naturally do that's compulsive they can't mm -hmm. not do that and i find myself with plenty of stretches of time where i can not do that mm -hmm. and so it it makes me feel like i have ended up more where where I'm supposed to be, but yeah. I, I can't say that I would have done that. I, I can't, if I was successful and I had opportunities to like work with brands because it just seemed like every, when, when Mia and I started filming all of our, our peers just kind of across the board and snowboarding that we're also starting to film, they just, uh, they work for big companies and they've got budgets and they spend time in other countries and they do all of this crazy stuff. And, mm -hmm the the highest uh, 
opportunity I ever got was to go film Amusement Mountain, which was an amazing opportunity, but it's not, it's, it's not like a fully budgeted, like that's coming out of Kimmy's pocket. Like Kimmy, yeah. Kimmy put on that whole event. And that's yeah. just the thing with, with where women have a place in snowboarding is typically where another woman's bankrolling it. Yeah. And, uh, and so I just, yeah. Cause I like, I, I'm not saying with Ashley Don, she was so talented with, with filming snowboarding and, and mm-hmm. that first year of jetpack her, her she, she would just, she drove out there. She was so sick she was, and she just oh. drove all the way out to the East coast with like, no, we barely even knew each other. Yeah. And she showed up and she filmed the best B roll I could ask for because I was very action driven. I was just concerned with capturing mm-hmm. the action and having her there to like get all of the secondary angles. It wasn't just like, Oh sick. Here's the second angle. It, it made everything work. It yeah. brought everything together. It brought together the personality and the emotion in it. And it was it was just having her there and the way she observed stuff. And she's she's so talented with that and, and we just snowboarding lost her. And she's yeah. do, she's doing way Yeah, she's doing big big girl stuff yeah. <laughs> out in Hollywood now. Yeah. And and uh, out with famous people every day. Yeah. <laughs> and and so it's 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 hard. It's kinda it's kinda the same deal when you get to um when you look at how many, how many women that have had professional careers stay in snowboarding yeah. and you got like Barrett yeah. and then, the, and then you look at all the other companies and like every team manager, brand manager, creative guy, they all like had a career at some point in snowboarding and now they're running snowboarding. But when you look at women in snowboarding, Kimmy is like breaking immense ground by maintaining her contracts while having a baby. That is yeah, not a thing that has happened because yeah. it's supposed to be like, well, you got pregnant, so you're done being a professional snowboarder. Yeah. And, uh, and I mean, that's gotta be so hard. Yeah. Cause you literally have to choose between like, keep doing the only thing that you've loved for your whole entire life or do something else. And, yeah. and that, yeah, I don't know. And so you have found your happiness in the mountains. Canvas jackets and, and uh, there's just there's there's a woman there's a picture of the first woman that climbed Rainier it was like in 1892 and she's got wow. she's got a walking stick that was like a shovel that she sawed off one end of it and she put tacks through her <laughs> shoes and she's wearing a full dress and she just ta- talks a about dress? yeah talks about how she how she slept in a steam cave on oh top of on the summit. God. And, and it's just like, she's like, yeah, like full blown, like 18, late 1800s dress that she climbed Mount Rainier in. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so I, but I feel you cause once you get trail running shoes then you're like, oh, I see why. Yeah. Cause I did break my ankle, um, in the, in those non trail running shoes oh, shit. one day. And, uh, and so then I got trail running shoes after that. <laughs> wow. Um, well, first of all, I want to say it's, it's pretty crazy. I, it, it's almost like technology and innovation and things like that just things to make stuff easier it 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 makes you forget about how internally powerful we are Mm -hmm. and like what we can actually do for sure uh that guy wim hof he yeah (laughs) summits mountains in shorts and you know it's like (laughs) yeah so that's 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 really cool but the ankle breaking i didn't i didn't know that yeah that that was um i was learning to run downhill and that's it like i didn't i don't know anyone that trail runs i I'm trying to Google things about it and I don't find anything that's helpful. And so I'm just going at this however I think is good. And so I was coming down a trail and I was probably about a mile from my car and I had Guar Hate Love Songs playing, which is like oh, yeah. a, a Pat Moore's part from Revenge of the Good Nerds. And I've hurt myself multiple times to this song. Really? <laughs> Mind you. <laughs> I've stopped listening to it while I do things now. Yeah, but, I'd, um, I'd say that's a good idea. Yeah, I just uh, roll, rolled my ankle and uh, uh, yeah, it, it was, it was bro- I like broke off a chip off the end of it. And so I, I like gimped myself out and was in a boot for like six weeks. Yeah. And um. Yeah, so running downhill, there's a technique for that, and you and you got to be aware. That was like where mindfulness started to very first come in for me. Is mm. you got after that, my mantra a lot of times is strong knees, smart feet, strong knees, smart Whoa. feet, and I just like say that over and over when I huh. like when I know I'm tired. If I like I'm starting to trip or like if my if I'm not moving as 
carefully as I want to because yeah. you got it because then I, I pretty I hurt my knees pretty bad from doing um I just kind of I went at it really hard I like did a couple half marathons and then the next year I did two full marathons and uh and then the next year I did two more full marathons and pretty much after that my knees said no no Jeez. more yeah and uh and that that what was what was your work up to those um I mean, did you, were you gradually increasing running to get to that point or? Um, not. Was that another full send? (laughs) (laughs) It all sounds so ridiculous when I say it out loud. No, it's, I mean, But, um, yeah, I, I really wanted to climb Mount Rainier and I was talking to my friend Andrew and he, he had just moved to Seattle and, and he said, I really want to climb Rainier too. And first person I ever met that wanted to climb a mountain with me. And so he's like, I signed up for a half marathon in a couple months because I feel like I should be able to do that if I want to go try to climb Rainier. And I was like, word, I'll do that too. And so I signed up for one and the, wow. I, I started trail running in the spring and then I signed up for a half mar- trail half marathon in Park City in the, in the fall that year. And before I went, the longest I'd ever run was six miles. That was just the furthest run I ever been on. Didn't, I don't, I don't know how to train. Like I, I, I wasn't, I would just like go do, I was like, oh, I'll go do superior like three more times. And then I yeah, think I'll be ready. It'll be good. <laughs> and, uh, and so I did, I did that. And when I completed that again, just like mind blown, I was like, I actually wow, did, I did that. It. Like I yeah. ran 13.1 miles the crazy. whole time. And, and it's a, Park City's got a great, uh, great trails that you're running on and it's, it's during the fall. So there's like beautiful colors. And, um, it was, that was just my first organized race that I had done. And I, I was super excited about it. So then I got into the Moab half marathon, uh, later that fall. And that was, that was down in Moab and you're just running in the desert. You start early in the morning and they've got like a, a full brass band. There's like a tuba and a mm, trombone cool. and they're all playing you out at the start at like six in the morning. And, That's amazing. Um, that was, that was my first time like camping the night before doing a race. And I really prefer to camp when I try, if I travel to do a race, I prefer camping because I feel like it helps prepare you to just go be outside and, mm-hmm. um, do all of that and connect with the landscape yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's like all like because um yeah there, there was there, I decided I really like this after the the second year I was doing races I was in sleeping in the parking lot and the race I went to it's called the Rut in uh, Montana it's on Lone Peak at Big Sky Mountain Resort and I was sleeping in my truck and I was doing like the 11k because I just wanted to check out check it out there mm-hmm. it's a huge peak it was a crazy course I just wanted to see what the vibe was at that race mm-hmm. and the people next to me they they showed up they have no car they just have backpacks they look kind of dirty and and uh and they like set up a tent like down in the ditch next to my truck kind mm-hmm. of and I'm like what are these people doing like are they runners are they really just yeah. like sleeping in a tent and and then I hear them talking and they're talking about doing the 50k, oh, like wow. like they're doing this and like I'm I'm like in my truck with this like good mattress and like yeah. all comfy and they're <laughs> they're in a tent and they're gonna go run like 30 miles the next day with a whole bunch of elevation gain and they did it like I heard them getting up that morning because it wasn't the day I raced I heard them getting up that morning and then when I got back they were like having having beers and. I was just like, these are, I love these people. Like these are like dirt bag runners. Like this is, I (laughs) love this because running, running especially gets this rap for just being so jockey. And so, like you said, like got to have the shoes and like so much of the stuff is just like bright neon colors and Mm -hmm. you got your times and you're racing people. It's so competitive and, and people get really self-conscious about it and it keeps them, it puts a block against yeah. running in their mind. Yeah. And I, I mean, the whole, like the triathlon industry or, or a lot of those industries, it's so, it can be so gear focused and it can become so expensive. Mm-hmm. Like I, I did my first ever triathlon and my coach was like, okay, you're going to need tri shorts. Like these are the cheapest ones. And they were a hundred bucks for just like some spandex shorts. And I'm like, dude, what the bike he let me borrow. Oh my God. Thank you for letting me borrow that. Uh, it was like a $6,000 bike I'm and sure. that was on the lower end. There's yeah. people riding like $15,000 bikes. And it's like, Oh my gosh, this is crazy. And, but I mean, you know, if, if, if there, if you can spend money to be a little bit better, I mean, it, it's, it definitely is a sport that people of all ages, can do and so you know you see a lot of rich people who are just like 
kid it out. <laughs> and then it's it's cool to hear that there's, you know, those dirt bag run, runners. I feel like that's maybe more on the mountainside because I don't mm-hmm. think I didn't see anybody. I mean, I, I did a triathlon in Malibu, so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't see anybody sleeping on the side of the road, like looking all grungy. Like, yeah. But uh, that's really cool. Yeah, and that, that I'm I'm just really drawn to uh, that side of trail running because it's, um, like it, trail running isn't about for for me it's not about being super fast or or anything like that for me you can cover so much ground so like you go on a hike for a day and you hike at whatever pace you're hiking at you can see x amount of miles of terrain that day mm-hmm. but if you go and you're you just like have your fitness up a little bit. You can go at a bit of a faster pace. You could double the amount of visuals you get in the day. Yeah, and that's so, pretty cool. And so it, you just and it's so fun to cover ground, like to be like I was on that ridge line and now I'm on this ridge line and I'm going to that one. And it just it's hilarious. It's like it's it's honestly just kind of funny when you're standing there and you're like, that's where we went, and yeah. it seems so far away. It's unbelievable. And it's just it's just with your feet. It's like because that's where I think run tr- like especially trail running. It's so obtainable. Like, like you don't need crazy shoes and then you just need your feet. It's, it's like, it's like the skateboarding of endurance events. Yeah. Like, cause like triathlon I know is, it's like so gear intensive, yeah, yeah. but, but if you're just going for a rip in, on a trail, like you just got some shoes, maybe throw a water bottle in your hand, but yeah. you, you and, can see it all. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not, I mean, it's technically a race, but you're not, you know, it's not really competitive. It's really like an individual thing. Like everybody's doing their own thing and everybody's happy for each other because you're just out there doing it. Yeah. You know? And so I thought that was, I think that's also a really cool aspect of all that stuff. Yeah. But, um, so you, you said once you get your fitness up a little bit is after you've done a number of runs and trail running, things like that, did you start to enact some kind of training or anything to build up your endurance or was it just more, more races longer and longer um i i was i was again just kind of like belligerently like I, I i see it as a time where i was just reaching out in every direction trying to find a wall i was like trying to find my limit i was like can mm-hmm. i do this can i do that like will this work mm-hmm. and so yeah i did i did a, a triathlon that year that i did the rut and uh it was a quarter iron man in in silver That's insane. In, in silver in silver thorn and uh and so leading up to that, like, I don't, I'm not a water person. I'm not a swimmer. Like that is not something that I do. And, um, building up to it, I was like, cool, like this will help me learn how to swim. Like I'm going to train for this. And I went swimming once before what? I went into this. And, and so like, it, it was a cold enough lake where, um, like I, you needed a wetsuit and luckily the wetsuit I rented was buoyant yeah. because I get in the water and, and it was helpful because there's so many people going into the water. So I was it's like, cool, intense. like I'm, yeah. with, I'm with people like this is why I'm going in the water. Yeah. And, and so I got in and uh, after trying like three strokes of freestyle, I just rolled over on my back and kicked for 0.6 miles. Wow. <laughs> I, wow. I was just like not prepared at yeah. all for it. And so that was the first time that I showed up to something where I was really like, oh, shit, I should have. I should have tried to do this a yeah. bit more. And, uh, yeah. and, and then that year I, I, I was doing marathons and I just, I just finished them. Like I, I, before my first marathon, the furthest I had ever run was a half marathon. And then I just did a marathon and then yeah. I did another one and then I did another one and then I did another one. <laughs> That's and, so crazy. and like, I'd go on like random runs, but I, I was just like, what is, what is this? Like you just do this. Yeah. But then after that, that third fall of doing races, my knees just quit. Like they mm-hmm. were so painful. I could, I could, I couldn't really, I couldn't even sit down on the toilet without having to brace myself because my knees would give me so much pain. And I saw a couple doctors and the doctor that I stuck with, he was just like, you're weak. And I was mm. like, I was like, no, I'm I'm not weak. Like yeah. I'm a, I run marathons. I run trail marathons. Yeah. And he's like, no, you're weak. Like you have a, your core isn't strong. Like your your the, all these muscles, like your stabilization muscles, they're not strong. Yeah. And he did a couple things that made me realize this. And so I started doing PT for that. Mm-hmm. And it's all really simple stuff. And it's it's more like 
just connecting your mind to your muscles and understanding mm-hmm. which muscles are firing and, and like just get muscular connection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Just like getting to know like what muscle is working when, and like seeing if you can get in touch with other muscles and mm-hmm. try to get them to fire up. And, and so that whole process, it was hard cause I went nine months without running at all. I couldn't even run a mile. It was too painful. Oh, man. And nine uh, months. Yeah. Damn. It really got bad. Yeah. It, it was not good. <laughs> and, uh, and, but that was really important because I, I just had no limits. And so I finally found a limit. I was like, okay, yeah. sick, like limit. You have to be strong to do this. Like you yeah. can't just accidentally do all this stuff. You have to be strong. So that's kind of where I first started, um, being aware of like what muscle groups were, were strong and what I could work on and, and different things like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that's, um, do you, do you mind me asking oh. specifically what uh, kinds of exercises you were doing? Was it um, mostly focused on your knees? No, it, it, core, was, it was. Yeah, it was. It was more my core and like my glutes, and so yeah. a lot of it is just a, with a rubber band. You uh-huh. um, you do these things called clamshells. So you like lay on your side, and you have the rubber band around your knees, mm-hmm. and you just like close your legs and then like open them and th- and then you do like different variations of that, mm-hmm. and uh, and then you like use the rubber band and you just do these like kind of crab walk things where you like put one foot next to the other one and then you stretch the rubber band out to take a sideways step and so it's like a lot of those side muscles and uh and so once I started to realize that you do everything with your glutes first like like when your glutes and your core so like now when I start I was doing longer runs this year and um so I'd start off the run using only my my core to move my legs. And then when my core started to get tired from doing that, then, I, then I'd start using my glutes. And Whoa. then and then when my glutes would wear out, that's when I'd rely on my on my quads. And so much when you run and you start to run, you're just like quads, quads, yeah. like quads are what's happening. And you're that, just like all legs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're just like my legs do this. Yeah. And and so but my quads got so out of whack that that's what made my knees super weird because my quads were doing all this work that like my glutes and my abs should have been doing yeah. and so is uh, that something that you just intuitively like once you started getting more in touch with your muscles you started thinking about that was that yeah something that the physical therapist was like when you're running you should no. focus on your core <laughs> no no that that that's all that's uh, all you yeah <laughs> that's really cool um and I, that's just thinking a lot while you're out there yeah i've had kind of similar experiences um i mean just I've gotten more in touch with my muscles lately than ever just from my rehab for my leg. But yeah, once you start to realize how, how much everything is connected and, and you know, you just naturally, you know, you can do something, you do it with the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And so when you're, you know, and I think that's where a lot of injuries come from snowboarding is when you fall abruptly and you're not, you're not like fully all your muscles are, you know, in touch with what you're doing, you're just kind of moving your legs around Mm -hmm. and that's an easy way for your leg to get in. Like, I mean, you can easily get in a crazy position if you are aware too, but it's just something I've been thinking about lately. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. You've had that similar experience. Yeah. Cause it's like, it's like, yeah, just, it was was also kind of like that strong knees, smart feet. Like it was the first time I was really thinking about like, don't drag your feet. Like you just tripped, you kind of tripped up on that stump over there. Like you should have lifted your foot up more. Like you're getting tired. Like let's remind those feet to be strong. And Mm -hmm. now it's uh, smart. Yeah. Or smart. (laughs) And, uh, and now wait, uh, is that your, did you come up with that too? Yeah. (laughs) Dude, you need to like write a book or something. (laughs) Wow. It's it's just a product of being being out on hours and hours and hours of running, just thinking about stuff. That's cool. (laughs) Man, I feel I, I feel like I that's useful even just walking around. Yeah, I yeah. tend to stumble while <laughs> like walking upstairs. Yeah, I'm like, okay, smart feet, come on, you yeah. got this. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. And then this uh, this recent fall, because um, this this summer I did two, so I did all that rehab for my legs, um, and got got strong again. Started running again last fall. My friend Kaylee picked up trail running and it was really convenient to have a, have a buddy and she was new. So everywhere that we went running, it was like, look at this place. And she'd never been there. So we, I got to revisit all these places, but having her with mm-hmm. was like having a new set of eyes Yeah, and she was just down. She wanted to go run everywhere. So we, we, cool. we did, we covered a lot of ground and, 
I got back into running and I was like, all right, I do like this. And now it doesn't hurt. Like my, my core is stronger and my knees don't hurt. I can do this. And, and so we signed up for, um, I signed up for a 52 K in June and a 50 mile race in, in August. And I did, I did all that around this time last year. So I had like all the whole time ahead. I was like, cool, I'm going to train this time. Like I see these benefits from PT, like I'm going to stick with a training plan. That's Mm -hmm. what I'm going to do. And, uh, and it, it went okay for about a week. And then I broke my shoulder in May (laughs) and, uh, and that really threw me off. It wasn't, it wasn't a bad break, but, um, I, I was snowboarding and just took a tumble and Ugh. and uh, broke my greater tuberosity in my shoulder. Greater tuberosity, I can't <laughs> say like, that I've. It's heard like that. the the ball of the socket, so it's like oh, the whoa. ball inside, it. and that's Crazy. the second time I've broken that on this arm, and uh, and so so I was like healing that, trying to run, and uh, what was the, what was the recovery process of that? Um that you're just supposed to be in a sling. I only wore a sling for like a week cause oh, really? Holy Bully was right after it. And, hmm. um, I've, and I'm doctors more doctors like you gotta go to Holy Bully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was doctor's <laughs> orders to go to Holy Bully. And, uh, and, and then we had, we had a trip to Glacier National Park with my friend, Jamie. She won a, a split boarding grant. It's called for in memory of Liz, Liz. She was a, um, split board, guide who passed away in an avalanche and so oh, there's man. a the live like liz grant and my friend jamie won it and it's for a, a split board adventure and she proposed going to glacier national park and so that we were supposed to do that right after holy bully so we did have to push that back a couple weeks because mm. we'd have to be carrying really heavy backpacks but yeah. um i just I, I didn't really rest it at all and so i think it stayed broken for a while i'm still on the tail end of Really? That was in April. And Have so, you been doing PT for that too? or just Yeah. Like, so I, I hit that hard with PT like the last month and a half or so. Is that resistance bands as well? Um, They did a lot of cupping, which oh, yeah. was wild. Cupping I, is crazy. It's awesome. It it helped um free it up a lot. And I had a couple exercises to do, but the cupping really, I would get that done like twice a week. And and that just, just started to loosen up. And then I was getting... um. A, ma- a massage that was like really centered on my shoulder probably yeah. like once a week as well. And, um, that finally started to, it's, it's really hard to take care of yourself when you're traveling. Like I, I broke my shoulder in mammoth and then I went straight to Mount hood for Holy Bully. And then I was supposed to go to Glacier national park. And yeah. I think there was like a couple other things happening around then. And then I was back out at hood and there was more snowboarding and then there was the rat race. And by the time I got, and then we had to go to Canada for the other race. And by the time I got home in, uh, the end of August, my shoulder still hurt really bad. And I was like, cool, I'm home for a couple months. Like, let's get that PT going. Yeah. And, uh, and so that it, it, I was so, I'm so happy that I was home for the last two, two, two and a half months because I was able to actually take care of, mm-hmm. um, of my shoulder. And, and so, and then the last month, uh, once my PT kind of ran out, I was doing a, a winter conditioning class at a yoga studio in Salt Lake called Seek. And, uh, and it's a really cool studio. They do a, a bunch of yoga, but it's more f- kind of fitness based yoga. Really? Um, so winter conditioning. So is it specifically for winter sports? Yeah, they, they run it. Um, it was like a six week, two classes a week thing. Oh, and, wow. uh, and it's just like a 30 minute circuit training system uh-huh. that's really centered on core and lower body. Cool. So there's like a little bit of upper body stuff, but a ton of it is core and a ton of it is just standing squats and yep. d- doing mountain climbers and different kind of a, a bit of free weights and kettlebell stuff. And mm-hmm. I was super new to all of that stuff. But, um, it, in addition, they recommended like going to yoga twice a week as well. And so I was just like, I'm home for all of October. Let's send it. So I got like the unlimited passes. And I think, I think I went like 24 times wow. that month. No way. And, and, I. Uh, and let me tell you, yoga is not just stretching. <laughs> it yeah. is. It is not just for flexibility. My my sh- my shoulders. I think that's what really sealed off my PT. Like my PT kind of broke up all the stuff, got it moving again, and then yoga mm-hmm. took it all the pieces and put it back together. Yeah. And and yeah, I'm I'm definitely stronger than I've ever been before, and I would attribute that to the winter conditioning yeah. yoga mix of the last month. Yeah, I I believe it. I mean, you go. 24 times. That's insane. <laughs> of course you're going to get stronger. 
And yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable the kind of stuff you can do with body weight training. Yeah. I've kind of recently been starting to get into it just because I want to do it while I'm traveling. And yoga is a perfect way to do it because, mm-hmm. you know, it's easy. It's easier when you're told what to do. Yeah. And also, I love the fact of yoga being a little bit uh, mind oriented. Oh, like yeah. You kind of fall into the movements and you're relaxing and you're also working. And in a way, it's kind of like moving meditation. Mm-hmm. And, I feel like that kind of blends everything all together, like, you know, joint stability, you're getting in these crazy positions, you're, you know, you're, you're training your body on balance and stuff like that too. Like that's, that's really cool. I'd actually, I, maybe I should try to get somebody over there on the podcast. I kind of want to try to talk to people who are on that side of things. Oh you know? yeah. Yeah. Sarah, Sarah would be great. She's, um, she's, uh, she's got her master's in nutrition and oh, has been a yoga teacher for like 10 years, but she, she, that the whole basis of their studio is they live really active outdoor lives. Mm-hmm. And so they understand, um, like endurance tra- training and, and different things that don't, you don't necessarily pair with yoga. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's kind of what they bring to it is they they have the circuit conditioning and they have TRX, which mm, is like, Oh this, yeah. TRX is intense. Yeah. It's crazy <laughs> how much of a workout you can get with that. Yeah. And, and I, I haven't, I haven't done too much in that, but we are starting to touch on that in physical therapy towards yeah. the end there. Cool. But, um, yeah, so that they, they just kind of have a full service, um, fitness area where it is, it all does come back to, um, your mind work and your focus, which, I think doing a, like a daily yoga practice is a good check-in with your body. Like I, I had one that I, I used to do quite a bit during the winter time, but you can go through and you kind of evaluate all your different joints and your different, if you're sore here or if this is harder than it usually is. And it, it, if you do it in the morning before snowboarding, you have a really good mental mm. image of what what's good, what's not. Like, yeah if you're feeling amazing, everything's perfect. And like, you can go try something really hard today. Or if you're just, you couldn't stay balanced on that one foot, you can usually do that. And for some reason today, you could not for the life that you do it. It gives you like, I think more of a real time picture of what's going on with your body. For sure. A little bit more mental preparation. I've never even really thought about that. I mean, I know that you're supposed to really check in with your body and see how you're feeling, but I oftentimes seem to leave that at the practice and <laughs> that's that's a really good idea to take that like okay this is what i noticed today yeah now as i go forward i'm at least going to be aware of that mm-hmm. and that's really cool yeah um i i also recently have been trying to get into meditation i've, I've always tried to get a nice yoga practice going but for some reason i can't stay on it it's very hard often. it's um, hard it's easy to talk about and it's yeah. easy to know that you should do it yeah and it's really hard to yeah. actually integrate it yeah, and also, you know, you miss it for a couple of days and then you're like, ah, oh, well, what's the point? That's <laughs> <laughs> so stupid. But yeah. Have you ever have you ever tried meditation or anything like um, that? Um, I've I've tried a little bit. I downloaded Headspace and I was super juiced on it after like I sat there, I did like three in a row and I haven't used it since and that was a long time ago. Yeah. And and it's it's hard because I want that's it's a really good example it's something that you know is good for you you know is easy to do like instead of maybe instead of watching netflix you could just pop in a meditation thing for a little bit yeah but um i i at this point in my whole uh journey i think my meditation is easier while i'm moving and to me that's okay right now and so yeah. I, I know that if I go out and I'm riding my bike or I'm hiking or I'm running that I, that in those, t- in those moments I can fall into this kind of state where every, everything that's happening, I'm not really noticing it, but I'm not, I'm not noticing anything, but I'm noticing everything. Yeah. And You're just engulfed. Yeah. And Flow state. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and then sometimes doing, doing yoga, like every now and then in the last month I'd leave a class and I'd be like, yeah, that was a good one. Cause I could, I could yeah. spend the whole, I had, I had this really good picture that I would, I would work on. Um, cause in the beginning of the month I was bringing all my problems from the outside into, into the studio and 
feeling, um, feeling the anxiety of the day throughout the whole class. And I was like, I got to stop doing this. Like, this is the time to be away from all that. Yeah. So I would imagine that like these brick walls would come up on the edges of all my, of my mat. Oh, and then genius. I was like inside of this castle. And then any thought that I was starting to have about anything outside of the castle, it would turn into a bubble and the bubble would float wow. over the castle wall. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that I did that for maybe four or five classes in a row. And that really unlocked another, another little thing where it, it's because it, it, the whole point to me of it is just being able to get, if you know you're in a place where you need to focus is being able to have a tool to remove all the excess noise. Yeah. And, um, and so that's kind of what I'm working on yeah. now. Yeah. I that's, guess. I mean, that is definitely a form of meditation and I love the, the visualization mm -hmm. that's, uh, I mean, I know that can be a super effective technique and I mean, I should try to enact that myself because I, I need to have the right kind of teacher in <laughs> yoga because if they're too much like, okay, do this and then focus on this and then focus on that. I'm like, my mind is just like that, 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 that. that and it's like, I need to just let the, I just need to be in my body and, and let those yeah. bubbles just float away. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess kind of changing paces here. Do you have any other recovery techniques other than the yoga for, and, and just getting stronger in PT? I mean, do you, do you roll out? You did a little cupping like, yeah, I, uh, foam rolling, super crucial. Yeah. Um, like being really regular with that because you can, you can get rid of a lot of knee pain just with foam rolling because mm -hmm. your, your quads and it's uh, so much of your quads, they just get bent out of shape. Your IT band, like as mm -hmm. soon as that gets flared up, you're kind of screwed for a bit. Mm -hmm. And so, um, foam rolling is great for that, uh, myofascial release. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, you can use a tennis ball or even your elbow and just really dig into certain spots and, um, yeah, to kind of just like, if you know that you're tight somewhere, not ignoring it, not just being mm -hmm. like, oh, it'll work itself out. Like give it, give it attention. Try to be mindful of that body part. It's obviously telling you mm -hmm. that it's upset. And so by paying attention to it, I think that that that's really important. And then as far as like, even just like, like, uh, protein shakes. Yeah. are sick <laughs> yeah yeah i'm all about it um, as well because you can you can really feel it if you go do something and exert yourself and then you come home and you and you have some kind of protein um you can feel it filling in gaps that yeah. are in you that like water is not gonna fill in or um you can still eat your food and everything but when that that's really nutrition. Nutrition is like the world I'm living in right now. Like mm -hmm. I, I feel like I got a good grip on physical fitness and endurance and the mental mindset that you need to put those things together. And, uh, and so I, I said I had signed up for a 50 mile race in August mm -hmm. and I pulled out of that race at mile 33 because my stomach was a mess. Oh no. I just couldn't keep During going. During the race. Yeah. Really? And and it's, it's What were you like what were you feeling like like cramping or like you were going to throw up? It was like I was going to throw up for like 10 miles. Oh. And 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 like I I would have to stop and like lean over and there's people just running by me and they're all like are you okay? Are you yeah. okay? I'm like yeah, I'm fine. And so I was never able to actually throw up, but my stomach was because when you're running for like 30 miles you, uh, the, your insides just liquefy because you're just like on a paint shaker. Like your, your stomach's yeah. like in a paint shaker. Yeah. Yeah. And so you really have, and, and there's no one answer. There's no like, Oh, well just eat this and you'll be fine because yeah. everyone is different. Yeah. And so there's like people working aid stations at long races are hilarious. Like people are like rolling water, pieces of watermelon in a bowl of salt and eating that. Oh. Or, or they, they, they're like, they're just housing bacon or they're, they're like Oreos. Like for me, a lot of times Oreos will just like juice me up again. Really? Yeah. And, uh, and you know, do you ever, do you ever have those like energy shot things, the little gels? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, those are really good. Um, I, I use those a lot on like shorter stuff and mm -hmm. I use them on longer stuff, but you just get to a point where nothing, nothing is good. Everything sucks. Yeah. And, and eating is a chore. It's just a chore that, and eating and drinking water, it's a chore. There's, yeah. there's nothing good about it. You don't feel like you're getting anything out of it. You feel like it's even going to make you more sick. I can imagine when you're exerting yourself that much, the, the stress of digestion and, and, and consuming something, 
your body is kind of like, I'm already focused on all of this right now. Like, what are you trying to do to me? You know, I, I, but I mean, having the stomach pain or have, having that feeling of yeah. throwing up, like, what do you, what do you do? You, you, um, that's just mental fortitude at that point. And I was not prepared to keep going. I just, I didn't, I, I didn't want to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and that's where some, some people, they, they can push through it and it, it has to be something that you want more than anything to be able to push through something like that. And I couldn't find that within me to finish that race. I felt that, um, I, I was, I was just done. And it's, it's, it's not uncommon for people to drop out of longer races. Like a lot of people will finish marathons. And then once you get past that, um, and like, like 50 Ks, I, I don't think there's a ton of people dropping out of that, but to, to run 50 miles, um, is, is just, it's a bit longer. And some, yeah, sometimes if, if you're, if, and, and that's where like, literally like what you have for breakfast, what you eat at every aid station, what you ate the night before, if you, if you don't get one of those things dialed, you're not going to finish yeah. and it doesn't. And the, there's, there's plenty of races that elite runners that they won't finish because so, something goes wrong and yeah, they just like had the, just barely had the wrong thing to eat. Yeah. And, and their body's just like, no. And, and, uh, and so I'm that, that was pretty much like, so like I had the red flag go up when my knees hurt and I was like, okay, I have to figure out strength and I have to figure out core strength. And then this was like my nutrition flag went up and it was like, yeah. you're, you got to figure this out. Like if you want to keep going on these long runs or if you want to do longer expeditions, different things like that, you have to know what your body is going to use. And mm -hmm. I, I start, I, I stopped eating meat about a year ago and, uh, and I, I don't really eat too much dairy either. Mm -hmm. And so finding out, um, it's, it's been just a real process for the last year trying to figure out what I want to eat, what makes me feel good, what gives you enough energy because yep. so it's, it's really hard in the beginning to look at a bag of spinach and just salivate about yeah. it. <laughs> no, I know. Trust me. I've, I've had my, my share of times just trying to be like, I'm going to eat these vegetables. How many times I have had one of those big boxes of salad because I'm like, if I buy a bunch of salad, I can just eat a salad every day and it just sits there and I'll have like maybe two salads and then it'll be almost done. And I'll be like, well, I'll give one more and then it's just gone. And it's like, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's really a skill. Like you have to, you know, it, there's been some times where I make a salad that's so good. And I'm like, oh, I'll, I should just make that every time. But then you have that like twice and you're like, well, I don't want to knit yeah. that anymore. <laughs> Something I've really, uh, I mean, do you, eat, do you eat eggs at all? Uh, no, no, no. Oh yeah. No, you're just fully, you're vegan. Um, pretty, like I, I really like fish and, okay. and cheese gets in there. Yeah. yeah. Off cheese will get fairly in often because yeah. damn cheese is good. Yeah. But, um, I, I just felt drawn to stop eating, uh, animal products. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and it, a lot of a lot of that t taking that step because I always thought if I wanted to be an endurance athlete or if I wanted to complete these like really weird things that I wanted to do that take a lot of energy, I thought you had to eat meat. I thought yeah. you had to. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of push for that. For yeah, sure. there's. I mean, yeah. And uh, and it wasn't until it was it was something I was watching and it was about not eating animal products and I was like, yeah, I've seen this stuff before. And then at the end, they had they had some vegan athletes. There was like yeah. this weightlifter and a yeah, football a player, bodybuilder, and, and yeah, yeah, all kinds of people. Yeah, and and they there there they are, just like doing their activity, being strong, feeling good, and and for for me, I'd have to say that my main reason of not consuming animal products is um, like carbon footprint. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that's, that's, that's like where my main motivation comes from. And like, obviously animal cruelty isn't good, but I grew up on a cattle ranch in Wyoming. So, uh, I still understand that that's where people make their money and yeah. everything like that. So, but for me, it's the, it's the carbon footprint of it all. So yeah. it was super appealing for me to be able to like get rid of that aspect of my impact mm -hmm. and that I could still obtain the goals that I was reaching for. Yeah, absolutely. And but it's a process to it's, make it work. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. I mean, it's it's really difficult to be vegan or to avoid animal products at all from the general public, but also especially if you're trying to be an athlete in any way. I mean, everybody, there's just this 
that internal feeling that you're like, oh, I, I must eat meat if I'm going to get strong because that's, you know, eat muscle, get muscle, right? <laughs> and I mean, I, I experienced it, although, you know, I think that it really did help me build my leg back up because I my bones weren't fusing together properly and I met with a nutritionist and she was like, you should probably do meat for a little bit at least. Um, but yeah, and, and something that we're really at odds with, with the whole thing is like for, there was, and I was talking about this with Chris the other day and it's like, there's new research that's showing that, you know, things like grass-fed beef, beef can actually be really nutritious and it's it's giving people who are just vegan for just the nutritious aspect of it they're like oh well i don't need to avoid animal products so i can still be healthy and be keto and eat all this meat and cheese and or i don't i don't know if you eat cheese keto or not <laughs> I don't know. uh but it, the thing that sucks about that is we there's just not enough space on the earth for everybody to eat grass-fed beef and for it to and the emissions, everything. It's just like a huge mess, like such a big problem that I don't know. I, the, I think the solution is going to be manufactured meat in a way, <laughs> like just, you know, making meat without the animal. Have you heard, heard about that stuff that they're doing? Yeah. Or, uh, I started, I've had some jackfruit and yeah. that, that, that stuff I, jackfruit's it, good. it was amazing to feed my mom a jackfruit taco without telling her that it wasn't pulled oh, yeah? pork nice. because she's uh, a little, skittish when it comes to not eating meat and like i said we grew up on a cattle ranch like it's not it's kind of sacrilegious to be like i'm not eating any meat at all yeah yeah and, that, that part of it is is huge for sure and <laughs> and so for her to to try that and to not even understand that that wasn't meat until i told her i think there are a lot of substitutes because you don't want to just rely on soy all the exactly, time for yeah. everything to just be like, it's in the shape of meat yeah. or something like that. And I think all that stuff is just going to get bigger and bigger and more popular and just kind of like slowly break down these barriers to be like, Hey, you can, you know, you don't have to eat meat to like get that sensation or to like fill out your plate. Cause that's the thing is somebody's like, Oh, I'm going to stop eating meat. And it's like, well then what goes in the middle of my burger? You know what I mean? And I jump, mm -hmm. What am I just going to eat bread and fries? Like, yeah, you know, so there's, I don't know. I think that's all really exciting. and Or even just learning how many things cauliflower can be. Like if you cut a big, a big thick chunk of cauliflower and yeah. you can, you can put that like a, like a chicken Parmesan, mm. but with cauliflower par Parmesan, yeah. make it the same way. Put red sauce on it. Tastes like chicken Parmesan. Um, same, same thing with like cauliflower rice. If you just blend up cauliflower and it turns into like what we just ate, yeah. that like cauliflower rice, it, uh, cauliflower wings oh, kind of tastes God, like, it, like, it, <laughs> like a buffalo wing. It's made of cauliflower and yeah. it's like you, you can still get the same kind of stuff. You just have to open your mind a little bit and, and, I uh, have some kind of motivation for it. Yeah. And, and just learning what tastes good. Like. Ashley and I make cabbage steaks where oh, nice. we just take a big head of cabbage and we slice it into like inch thick pieces mm -hmm. and put some, uh, you know, either some vegan butter or my favorite is this, uh, this sauce that's like garlic sauce. It's just garlic, lemon, and I think a little salt or something like that. Like super simple, but just put that on there with some salt and pepper <coughs> and you bake it. And it is the most delicious thing ever. It is unbelievable. I could eat it, eat that all day. And that is something I never would have thought of trying. Just like what? I'm just like cut up a cauliflower into a big piece <laughs> or a cabbage. Yeah. And then you just eat it like a steak. <laughs> and it's great. Um, but yeah, speaking of what we just ate, you've been you've been on this what is the what is it called? Um uh the like the what the food. The food, yeah. Oh, the food uh, the it's it's called, it's called hungry root. So, um, I just, so I've been doing the plant-based thing and trying to figure it all out. And then this last month I had some issues with my th thyroid and found out I have an autoimmune disease called Hashimoto's and, mm. uh, that's where, uh, your body creates, uh, antibodies that attack your thyroid. It thinks your thyroid is bad. So you're like, oh, your no. body's attacking your thyroid huh. and, uh, and that leads to eventual thyroid dysfunction. And then you have to take thyroid medicine to replace the hormone that the thyroid makes. And so, uh, having an anti-inflammatory diet is, a a helpful thing in kind mm -hmm. of prolonging my thyroid function. 
And so a big part of that is, is removing gluten from my diet, which I feel like there's so much stigma about that. There's a lot of stigma. And, uh, sure. and, and I, I really try to be accommodating when I go places. Like I bring snacks and I bring mm-hmm. my own food because it's really hard to explain to people that why you're trying to avoid a certain food, especially when there's a stigma about it right now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I was having a really hard time eating full whole meals with all of these new, like I'm trying to be a, essentially a gluten-free vegan, which is, yeah, seems You're limited there. really difficult, yeah. especially going from not being that a year ago to doing this now. And so uh, there's a, a meal service called Hungry Root, and I've, I've just been getting that um, re- recently to try to kind of reset my mind about how the food, how food works, like what is what can be food that you wouldn't normally think of like eating a head of cauliflower. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so it's a gluten-free vegan diet that, um, they give you a, a, like five, five meals a week and you cook them up. It takes like 10 minutes to cook. And yeah, it was unbelievable how quick you cook that, like 10 minutes and it was so good and yeah. delicious. And that was gluten-free vegan. Oh, it yeah. It, and it, cause it, it, it it just opens your eyes to, and yeah. the craziest thing is the desserts that come with it. There's, it's like black bean brownie batter. Whoa. And so the first ingredient is black beans, but it's like got little vegan chocolate chips in it. And, and oh. you just like put, scoop it out like co- cookie dough or brownie batter Crazy. and you bake it and it's like pretty good. And, yeah. and, uh, and then there's like, like a, a chickpea snickerdoodle and a, and a white kidney bean, something or other and mm-hmm. and it's just these like basically a bean paste with like some maple syrup in it or something and you put that onto the baking pan and then you like have cookies that like it's not cuz the danger of like the gluten-free wormhole is like you just want to avoid processed foods and so yeah. so if you're like oh I'm gluten-free so I buy gluten-free cookies Which is and they're just... made out of just all of there's plenty of stuff in there that yeah. you don't want anyway. Like the yeah, that happens with vegan stuff too. And, and I'm not gonna lie, sometimes you, know, you, you indulge. And <laughs> yeah, you're like oh, it, it's okay. But really, it's just you know, it's about as bad as getting the non-vegan version of that or yeah. non-gluten-free version of that. Yeah, because you're not like, oh, I'm vegan, so I eat tofurkey dogs every single night. Yeah, exactly. Like, no, you eat vegetables. That's yeah. what you do. And like maybe you have a tofurkey dog every now and then. Yeah. But um, yeah. So it's. It's all been, all been a really big adjustment, but I'm hoping that uh, once I get, I've, I have more blood tests uh, at the end of the month that will tell me if um, every everything's still happening the way it was when yeah. my thyroid was super inflamed. And cool. um, yeah, so I, I, that's kind of like something I'm working on right now, but it's crazy how Hashimoto's, as soon as I started talking, I put it on my story on Instagram and I got a bunch of people messaging me saying like, oh, I have Hashimoto's. Like, this is how I deal with it. Like, my friend has it. And I'm just like, all of these like young girls have have this autoimmune disease. And then we're like at a nutrition class at the yoga studio. And like five of us there were there because we had questions because we have all all had different autoimmune diseases that we've been diagnosed with. And it's that and, and like the tumors and all that stuff it's it's uh as you get a little bit older it's kind of alarming when i look around at how many <laughs> of my friends this is all happening to yeah. and um but i think that part of it is because of the kinds of the just the food industry and the way processed foods are that we've been eating our whole lives like yeah. our parents didn't eat the food that we ate our whole yeah. lives oh no and it's worn, yeah yeah it's it's different now. It's very different. I mean, even even the vegetables we eat, like everything is so different that, uh, you know, I think we're in a crazy time right now where everything, everybody's kind of just like, we're trying to see how we can figure this out, you know? And yeah. I mean, I think this, this the subscription thing that you're doing is pretty cool with the food. And it's a really cool way to learn just how to take all these random ingredients and and start to put them together like you could probably easily i mean maybe not easily but now that you've made that yeah from all that pre-made package stuff you're like okay there's not that many ingredients in here i could probably whip something like this up together and that's an idea for a meal that you wouldn't have had in the past and something that i noticed in there is which is just kind of a cool little uh hack for avoiding meat is that uh beans and corn together create a complete protein and so it's easily absorbed 
uh, and you've got the a bunch of cauliflower and just like a little bit of that the spices. It, it really mm-hmm. brings everything together. So that was yummy. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I don't I don't think that's the end goal is to have a meal subscription yeah, program. Exactly. Yeah, But um, it's just really it helpful in, in this in this period of time where. I'm just really at the throes of my, what my body's doing and what kind of food I, yeah. cause it's pretty much like an elimination diet right now. And then mm-hmm. I can reintroduce Start, things, yeah. but especially since I stopped eating gluten, I, my acne was like out of control and no I stopped eating gluten and, and it's, it's like there a bit now, but it is substantially better than it was a month ago. Cool. And, uh, and same thing I've noticed with sugar when I limit that. So, yeah. But it's, it's, I've been going through this phase where I'm just like limiting everything. Like I, I, I like stop, I, I stopped smoking cigarettes and then I, then I stopped eating meat and then I stopped and like eggs and all that stuff. And then a year ago, like last week I stopped drinking and, uh, and now, now I don't, now I'm like not eating gluten and so yeah you just, a lot of my friends are like what are you doing and how do we hang out with you yeah like why are you doing this to yourself <laughs> and i can't even really say why but um i i just it's a big experiment right now and i'm just trying to strip it all down yeah so i can start from square one yeah reintroduce yeah Be like okay this my body's rejecting this that's yeah i totally get it yeah. what, what was the hardest thing to give up um, sugar is the hardest thing to mm. get up. I'm mm-hmm. really was trying to work on that, but That's out of, one. out of all, out of all the, th- like you, you would think, I, I mean, I would think it would have been drinking and like drinking. It took me, it c- took me a couple tries cause I was, I liked to drink <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, and it took, it took a couple tries like the year before last year I quit for a month and it was like the hardest month of my life. I just thought it was insane and I hated everything all the time. Really? And as soon as that month was over, I was like, cool, I'm back. And, uh, and, and then last year I was on my way to Mammoth opening weekend. And for whatever reason, I finally felt like I was ready to let it go. I was like, I'm just going to let this go. And my initial goal was New Year's. I was like, I'm just going to let this go. And then New Year's, that'll be cool. And then, and then I like made it through Thanksgiving and I made it through Christmas and then it was New Year's and I wasn't drinking. And then I was at SIA and I made it through SIA without drinking. That's an accomplishment. Wow. (laughs) Like there, there was people that, that don't normally drink and, and they were looking at me with these dead eyes the night out the day after one of the parties. And I was just like, I feel great. Yeah. And, and the number of people, especially it started at SIA, they'd be, they'd notice I was drinking a water bottle or something and they'd, they'd with their eyes kind of glazed over, they'd lean in and they'd say, man, I really need to try that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's pretty sick. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really cool that, that you've been doing that. And I think that touching into that where people are like, Oh, you know, I mean, when you feel like shit the next day, I oftentimes I'm like, mm, I didn't, did I really need to have that much? And like, yeah, if I saw you and you're like cheery, eyes look great. I'm like, wow, I'm jealous like, for sure. <laughs> um, but is there, are there any techniques that, that worked particularly for you uh, to, in the cessation of, of either smoking or drinking or any, I mean, I guess any of these other uh-huh. things. Um, I think, I think running helped a lot with smoking. Uh-huh. Because um, I would get I would get done with a run, and I, I would have a cigarette. Like I'd be done running, and I'd be like, cool time for a cigarette. Oh, man. And uh, and that was and and like I I don't know like ever uh, you do something really long and hard and strenuous. Like sometimes sometimes you have a cigarette, but it's uh that that once I started to realize that if I didn't smoke for like a few days and then I went and ran, I could breathe so much better and I could run farther and I didn't feel sick. And I was, and so it was really like the longer my runs got, the less I had any drive to smoke tobacco because I just, you, you immediately saw the difference. Yeah. It was, it was so noticeable and I was enjoying myself so much with running that it was, it was just a lot easier to cut back on tobacco. And I I don't really know when that ended. I didn't have like a strict day where I was like, I'm done, but it just kind of faded away. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then drinking a huge help is this whole LaCroix 
thing. Oh, yeah. It's the best. Oh, my God. Because you just crush a case of LaCroix yeah. and, and like nothing happened. But you felt like you were at least you put a LaCroix in a koozie. You even think that you're getting yeah. the same feeling like you yeah. have you have or a kombucha. That's been a big one for yeah. me because yeah. it's still it's fermented. So it still has that taste to it. Mm-hmm. And and I. Uh, and you can just like sit and drink a kombucha, sip it like a cocktail mm-hmm. with your friends that are drinking cocktails and you feel involved. You feel because yeah. it's not, it's so boring. Just be like, I'll have soda water. Please. Yeah, yeah. And people or, are like, yeah. Ooh, put, put bitters in a lime and soda water. You'll never want. I'm like, Oh, this is gross. Yeah. And so having tasty non-alcoholic beverages available yeah. with kombucha and LaCroix and stuff like that it's really helpful because it's such a social thing Mm -hmm. that you want to do with people and like I have to like I have to be transparent I've probably had like 10 alcoholic drinks in this year that I haven't been drinking and um and that that to me is just that's just being real like that's to me that is not drinking the amount that I was drinking yeah having less than a drink a month is not drinking and, uh, and it, it might, it, like one, like w- one time I had like a glass of Prosecco after a really successful split boarding trip in Slovakia. And mm. that's, that's where, cause the whole time it's, it's like custom to drink these weird drinks and all the, the locals that you're with, they look at yeah. you and it's like, you're crazy for not drinking. Yeah. And, and it wasn't, it, I didn't feel it succumbed to peer pressure. It was just the end of a really successful trip and it was a special moment. And so I had a glass of Prosecco, but it felt immensely gratifying to have the one drink and to be good, good with that. I just had mm-hmm. the one. It was, I feel like this last year, any alcohol that I had is the first time I had alcohol in a manner that wasn't binge drinking. Yeah. And, and that is... Because there are there are humans that go their whole lives like that. Like they have like one drink and like, cool, that was fun. Like, I like that, but I'm good. Yeah, yeah. And for me, if I had one, I had five. Yeah. And and if I had if I slope. had five, I had ten. Like yeah. it was and, and then you like the only way you can get going the next day is to have more. So yeah. it's uh it's a really slippery slope. And and so this last year was the first time I've ever felt in control of that. And I d I don't know what that means to other people that are sober and I and I don't know if that makes me not an actually sober person and I don't I don't have a deep tie with with sober communities and so yeah. I don't want to um to try to say I'm anything that I'm not but I'm just being real and that's this is me going down this path to not being out of my mind drunk all the time yeah <laughs> and yeah so, I mean, um, it, whatever it, works yeah. for you you know yeah I mean for a lot of people it is the community that that they that makes them feel good and, and uh, allows them to keep away from it but if you have if you have your methods of doing it and you're feeling good you're you're waking up feeling great like you know, mm-hmm. kudos. That's yeah. great. And, uh, as far as having, having a non-alcoholic beverage, a lot of times that's preferable to me. I, I mean, especially when I'm, when I'm at my house and I'm, you know, doing some kind of chore where I'm like, Oh man, it'd be nice to have a beer right now. But you know, I, I'm pretty affected by it. And if I have one beer, I'm going to be like a little lazier later in the day. <laughs> yep. So I'm like, well, I kind of want to like do something later. So yeah, I'll have a kombucha or, or yeah. something like, there's always something fizzy in my fridge. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I just, I love it. And, and, and that industry is growing like crazy. Like, I mean, I love seeing that you guys just have these cans of, of kombucha. <laughs> like, did you get a 24 pack kombucha? No, like, I, I want to do that. J- that J- Jill's cool. got a hookup. <laughs> really? Yeah. Dude, I gotta get, uh, you gotta get it. <laughs> gotta get on that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, and it's cool, like you just you like rediscover lemonade, and you rediscover yeah. Ar- 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 uh, and you rediscover Arnold Palmer's, and you're like, wow, th- there's so many beverages that yeah. I want to drink out there. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I noticed that you have some rock climbing equipment laying on the floor right here. <laughs> um, is that is that a newer thing or how long have you been rock climbing? Uh, yeah, that, that's a newer thing. Um, it's, uh, it's been about the same amount of time as split boarding. Cool. Um, cause when I, I first got a membership at a climbing gym because I, so I've been going on these runs and I'm running up mountains and I'm on these 11,000 foot peaks in the Wasatch and you get into some positions where you're kind of exposed. Like there's, it's like, 
you can put your foot here and you can put your hand here. And if you put anything anywhere else, you're going to like fall a couple hundred feet. Mm. And so I was like, I should like probably take up rock climbing. Like, yeah, like I, I just want to be safe up here and I want to like be more in touch with like what these movements are and be more comfortable. So I don't have to like freak out. I can just do this and know that yeah. it's okay. And, uh, and so I got a membership at a climbing gym and I was just like running on the treadmill that overlooked the bouldering area because I don't know anyone that climbs and I've never done it before. So I watched people for a oh, couple wow. weeks. That's cool. And then, uh, and then that dissolved into me having the tumor. And then, so when I, when I came back from that, I would go again and I would just like walk on the treadmill and I would watch the people climbing. And so once I could start to climb, then I, I'd be like bouldering, which is when you're climbing without a rope, it's just yeah. on, on a wall with a, a pad under it. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, so I did that for a while and then, and then I finally, uh, my friend Zeppelin, we started going climbing a lot together. And so we, then we could climb on the ropes and climb bigger stuff. And, yeah. um, and then, and then I started climbing with my friend Sean a lot and, Sean's like my adventure buddy. We do a lot of long runs together. He's a total beast in the mountains and cool. takes really nice photos and is always like wanting to do more than I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we then we started climbing together a lot and um, it's it's fun because the the kinds of traverses that we want to do in the Wasatch and like abroad, um, it's it's not necessarily free soloing because it's not it's not like a vertical wall like when you say free solo you think of like alex honnold on, yeah, on like a yeah. vertical wall yeah but it's it's uh you're you don't have a rope and sometimes it can be up to like two thousand feet of exposure below you and yeah. so it's you're 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 moving very mindfully on these like knife edge ridges high high up of, off the ground yeah. and so to us uh, and and sean and i really like doing that and so to us it's important to be going to the climbing gym and being stay keeping your upper body strong and like understanding movements and but then it's been in, in the last this fall um Sean Sean really started he, he's to climb in 512 now and and I can like dabble in 511 and this is all in the gym so it's not like real to outside but now we're starting to climb a little harder and we're like checking out what outdoor climbing is like and again like yeah. I, nobody's taking me to go do this stuff yeah. and so it's like just through trial and error and I do have this one friend, Kit, Kitty Calhoun. Um, she she was a, a great big alpinist back in like the 90s. And I met her at a wilderness medicine class. And uh, she's she's been like the biggest help for me because I just randomly bump into her and she'll she like she belayed me the first time I ever climbed outside. And then she belayed me the first time I ever led outside. And it makes no sense because I rarely see her. And I don't know. I, how lucky how I got lucky enough to have her to teach me things but it's it's hard when you're trying to explore new spaces in the outdoors and it gets so intimidating because there's so much gear so much knowledge and lingo and yeah and when people know how to do it they like to do it with the other people who know how to do it so when yeah, you're just yeah. this kook that's like I want to climb the rock yeah. nobody is really trying to take you to do it and yeah. um so it's kind of the same thing as trail running i'm just like sean and i are just figuring it out and um we've taken ourselves climbing outside twice now so Sick. nice <laughs> well, I, I started climbing a couple months ago cool yeah that's so exciting i love it yeah i really like it um i haven't gone outside yet and i max out at uh i max out at a 510B, I think. I but I, I recently started lead climbing like a month ago. Cool. And I and I lead climbed to 510B and it Hell was like yeah. I was so fucking excited. <laughs> it was like I fell once halfway through, which you know, I don't know if it fully counts or not, but and I almost gave up, but then I was like, all right, let's go. Cause it's so it's such a mental game. Like you know you're safe, but I mean yeah. you're also maxing out your strength and it's just for me, it's, it's been a really cool way to, to continue to get to know my body, mm -hmm. uh, with doing the physical therapy and stuff. One of the reasons I took it up is I was like, okay, well, skating still kind of hurts and I wanted to continue to build up my fitness. And this was after the triathlon. And I figured that if I wanted to get used to snowboarding where I'm going to be in all these weird positions, 
uh, I was like, okay, rock climbing might be kind of cool. And some of my friends do bouldering back in Minnesota and they actually were like, dude, yeah, you would like it. It's like problem solving with your body. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa, that, that sounds really interesting. I never really thought about it like that. And I just, I actually kind of landed in a perfect situation because I was working at a coffee shop and it was my, I think it was my first day there. And I met this girl, Bree, who worked at the coffee shop and it was just kind of like, oh, hey, I'm working here now, you know, and, and then that was the same week that I started rock climbing. So I went to take my first intro to climbing class and she was there no. and I was like, whoa, <laughs> hey, what's up? And it was kind of awkward because it's like, hey, I know you, but I actually don't know you at all. And she was like, hey, and I was like, so you do you come here a lot? And she's like, yeah, I, I, I do. And I was like, oh, well, I'm going to get a membership. She's like, cool. Well, we should like climb sometimes. And apparently her, uh, it's her and her boyfriend had moved there a couple months ago and her boyfriend has a nine to five. And so during the day, she, there's a lot of days where she wants to go climbing, but she didn't want to go by herself. And, and I had a lot of free days. And so she was hyped and I was hyped because now it was all of a sudden we just were like, okay, well, I guess we'll just start climbing together. Damn. And, um, and she's been climbing for a year and so, uh, she's been really helpful with just like the mm -hmm. beginnings of it. And she's actually the one who eventually, after we had been climbing together for about a month, she was like, okay, you're going to learn how to lead climb. And I was like, <laughs> really? You think? I, I don't know. It's kind of crazy. But she's like, yeah, cause she likes to lead climb. Mm -hmm. She's like, if you know how to lead climb, then you can blame me. Yeah. And so I did it and it's like a whole, it's like a different thing. Totally. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, it's been great, and it's a really cool way. Like I was saying, you get your body in all these crazy positions, and it was good knee therapy because I'm, you know, there's certain points where I'm like extra loading in a crazy position, which mm -hmm. is really similar, at least I think, to snowboarding. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's just made me a little bit more confident in with my body and like understanding it as a whole. So mm -hmm. that was that's really cool. That I mean, if you could. So you're going to have to take me splitboarding. Yeah. Take me climbing outside. Maybe even trail running. Yeah. Never tried let's that let's do like, it. Trifecta. Yeah. There we go. That sounds great. <laughs> cool, man. But yeah. Cl yeah. I'm, I'm just, uh, cl climbing just opens up so much possibilities, like being able to use rope work and being confident in your skills of like ascending and descending different kinds of rock that really comes into play. Cause at the end of the day, all these extracurriculars that I do, funnel into snowboarding like i i start trail running is for higher fitness so i can climb peaks with my snowboard and yeah. climbing is training for for rope work and and like just understanding how to ascend and descend for yeah. when i'm with on my snowboard and all these things that it may seem like i'm just going in a bunch of different directions but at the end of the day they all funnel into making it so that I can reach the peaks that I'm trying to climb with yeah, my snowboard. Absolutely. And I think there's definitely something there. And I think there's not that many people talking about, you know, I mean, not trying to sound like a jock or anything, but I think most people would like to improve their performance on a snowboard, you know, and if there's a couple things that I can do that I can, you know, spin with a little more control or just like get hurt less, you know, I think it's, I've gotten really into it and I, I think it's super cool that, that you're getting into it as well. Mm -hmm. so. And it, it's cool to see it reflect in my actual snowboarding, like not, yeah. not split boarding, but just like this, this summer at hood, I, I was jumping pro probably the strongest I've ever jumped in my life. That's amazing. And, and that's hilarious to me because I've been snowboarding for 18 years now and you can't, you it's it would two years ago if you told me like you're gonna be riding the jumps at hood the best that you ever have before yeah um in two years i'd laugh i'd be like that's no i Damn. peaked like five yeah. years ago with jumps i don't jump anymore that's not what i do but the that's stronger incredible. you get and the more aware you are of your body like i the the way i snowboard now it has so much more control and mm -hmm. and uh more confidence and i know for a fact that it's because i've prioritized my health and my strength yeah and and that Absolutely. that to me is really gratifying because snowboarding's the thing i've the only thing i've loved longer than snowboarding is my mom and so if i can extend my relationship with snowboarding through um taking care of myself i'm down like that i want to do it forever beautiful <laughs> that's amazing 
What? Wow. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I got one, one thing I'd like to add to that, which, I mean, I, I almost just want to end it right there. That was, that was pretty good. <laughs> cut. But one thing I want to say that uh, about today at Sculp, there was a jump and you were supposed to do a 720 double grab. And I, I was like, I'm, there's no way I'm doing this. Like definitely not doing it in four tries. And somehow I got it first try. What? And I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a jumper, even though it was a tiny jump, but you know, and I haven't, I haven't, I don't think I've done a seven in like two years, let alone like coming off the injury, everything like that. And I, I just, I wonder like, is it, is it like my core strength that I've built from swimming and rock climbing and like this body weight stuff that all of a sudden I just did that like so easily? I don't know, but I like to think maybe so. Yeah. Cause I, I think, um, something I got turned on to a couple of years ago was, uh, cause like using the word athlete and, and, uh, say like, like we're, we're talking about things like jockey is not, not what we want to identify exactly, as. Yeah. And, and it's to, to me, it's just being as a- active as you can, as much as you can, because then you can enjoy all of your activities more. So it's like in your, in your off season from what it is you like to do, if you find a really active other thing to do, Mm -hmm. you, you don't have to have a regimented gym workout. You don't have to have, um, every now and then, like maybe you, maybe you do a lot of yoga for a month because you like want to improve something. You can always have things you're working on to improve Mm -hmm. and, um, but really just staying active is mm-hmm. so important. And that that's a way that that's the way I look at it. Like it's, there's not enough snow. I'll go for a run. Like, yeah. it, like I'm tired of running. Like I'm going to go ride my bike. Yeah. Like I, I don't want to do that. Like you, you go for a hike. Like you do, do anything. The more that you move, the more longer you stay in shape and the better yep. shape that you get in. And then you start having more fun because you can yeah. go longer and see more things and, you recover faster. So it's addictive. You just yeah. want to have all the fun that you can. Yeah. And, and to a point you're like, wait, this is, this is like what I fell in love with when I was young and I was just doing this stuff naturally. Like yeah. just, you know, so yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I think that's going to be it. Cool. Thank you for wrapping it up with yeah. your <laughs> great wisdom. You need to write a book. Um, uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Some point. Yeah. But all right. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, I really had a good time chatting with you. Yeah. That was, thanks for doing this podcast. I'm excited to listen to what everyone else says. Yeah. Yeah. I should be coming out pretty soon. So. Yeah. Cool. cool. Well, thank you. Of course. <laughs> See you. <ya>. Bye. <laughs>